my private key. Oh, here we go. Okay. Let's put it rich key. <laughs> I, I don't work for uh, industrial conglomerate. Yeah, that's, that's, that's <laughs> the way it is. <laughs> you would yeah, be tech over there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, good. Good morning, everybody. It is half past, so um, let's call the meeting to order. AJ, hey, good, good morning. <laughs> is this working? Okay, that's better. I'm just going to, as they say, lean in. Okay, so it is half past. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to everybody online. Um, quick Reminder, uh, this session is being recorded. Um, if you don't like being recorded, then sit somewhere where you can't be seen. Um, and don't say anything, obviously. Um, in the same, so um, agenda uh, is as published. There's been a small change to presenters. Um, Yogesh has decided to go home slightly early. Uh, so Cedric's going to do the, um, uh, the technical part on registration policies, but otherwise uh, no agenda hacking, so we are as posted. Um, so first first bit of that is the um, uh, introduction. So um, as ever, note well the note well. Uh, this is an official meeting. We are all bound to the rules and processes of the ITF. Um, you know, if you say stuff um, and you are responsible for it, and if it has IP implications, then well, you're responsible for those too. I'm sure we all know the note well by now. If you don't, uh, please really do familiarize yourself um, with it and with BCP 79, because uh, we have to take care of this all the time. Uh, this is a good moment also to remind everybody, um, as part of that, uh, your attendance at the meeting should be recorded. So if you are in the room, uh, you can join the light client on MeetEcho. Um, so just, you know, hop on your phone and press what they call the on-site tool that will record you automatically. If you don't or can't do that, um, then please do make sure at some point before you leave the room, um, you scan this and yeah, we'll just pass it around during the meeting. Uh, scan the QR code, that'll get you recorded and you get nice uh, brownie points. And you get to say you were at one of the best events of 2023. <laughs> so, um, note also the, the note really well. Um, the note well, really is all about um, the, the, the content that we produce and discuss at the meetings. The note really well is about the conduct uh, and the way that we do that. Um, we're all cool people. We're all here to do cool stuff. Um, so please be cool. Um, and if anybody does have any concerns, if anybody experiences any negativity, you can, of course, report it. We will take it seriously and we will make your environment a nicer one to be in. Um, so. Uh, some links here, uh, that's just for posterity, uh, if, if, if anybody gets lost, so we don't need to go over that. Um, but note-taking is important. Uh, it's very important to reflect accurately what everybody says and how the conversation goes. Um, Mr. Steve Lasker has kindly agreed to take notes, so we already have one. Um, but if anybody else would like to help, uh, that would be fantastic. Okay, thank you. Another volunteer, excellent. Um, mate, yeah, what, what's your name, sir? So Frank Shaw has just um, agreed to do that. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, anybody else who likes cute hedgehogs, um, you get the bonus of seeing the cute hedgehog if you take notes. Um, so thank you very much. Um, that's it, I think. I think that's everything for intro. So um, with that, we'll start the first real session. Um, oh, this is... I'm going to quickly check in the background that we have the right version of the slides, because that's wrong. It should be five minutes. Um, but uh, Mr. Hank Burkholz is going to come and remind us why we're all here. Which the multiple other ones? This one. Hi, this is Hank. Welcome everybody to the Monday session at the IETF 118. 
It's early in the morning. We all love that. <laughs> Again, my name is Hank, and this is a small recap on Skit. Next slide, please. So, oh, oh it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It was <laughs> animated, so flames. <laughs> <laughs> So I can't even read this, but I don't want to stay in there. Yeah. Why are you, what are we doing? I'm going to put the PDF version up because if we can't see your animation, this will let you at least see your um, text. Oh, yeah. yeah, what's the point of? There you go. Thank you. So, yeah, um, <laughs> why are we doing skit? Um, a lot of uh, um, trust in signing things is needed over time. Um, trust relationships to trust anchors and certification authorities that's authorities change over time key material sometimes even gets lost so um you need authenticity for a long time about statements so our core motto here is a simple scalable authenticity layer for endorsements endorsements is what i'm talking about i have a few examples here because we have a software supply chain use case at the bottom you can see which can these statements can be software builds of materials there can be a relationship statements about them like on sites, et cetera. There are things out there. Um, and when you look at regulation requirements, uh, authenticity and signing is not the first thought. Uh, Skit makes this intrinsically its first thought because products will move along your supply chain. Statements will be accessible by some of them that are not you. And there's importance in, in retaining authenticity after the fact when the certificate has uh, burned out already after the three weeks of his lifetime or the company is burned out after its two weeks of lifetime. So next slide, please. Uh, yeah, as soon as I get my network connection back. There okay, you thank you. <clears throat> so what we're doing here is we are combining a few things. We said uh, scalable and lightweight and such. So this is compact. We're using Seabor as this authenticity layer. Uh, we, are, we are trying to uh, define it very well, so there is no ambiguity here. So we're using a data definition language for that. And uh, of course, we are using an established signing mechanism for Cibor that's cozy. So these are very obvious building blocks. And um, with this, we sign two things in the end and create two things in the end. It's the thin layer around your statement. I always bring up the uh, example of a cat video. Uh, you can put in there whatever you want because that statement is opaque to the skit intrinsic services and the building blocks that we produce. Um, that is created by the issuer. Um, the transparency service in the middle that acts like a notarization service is basically uh, storing all these uh, statements in a uh, append only lock to make them transparent. Again, this is a building block in order to actually query something or uh, to put something into such a append only lock, you will need applications. This is not the application. This is the authenticity layer we are defining here. And in the end, uh, this receipts you will get back. We call them receipts because it's actually really cool. As now basically a delegation of trust to the transparency service, where um, when you have this receipt, you have a proof that you said something. And sometimes it's it's good enough for a small thing to have a offline validated proof because it's signed. You can again with a trust anchor. Uh, the certification path um, check its validity offline, that's good enough for some scenarios. And if you don't know what that receipt actually means uh, and what the pointer to the registration policies that's in there are mean right now, you can put it to a policy service that's close by and it can check it for you and say, oh, that's A-OK. -okay. So you can install that firmware or you can like that SBOM that is uh, basically representing some software that you're running right now as a service. And so all these trust relationships are somehow uh, going through the uh, transparency service that is the application layer implementation of a SCIT uh, authenticity system. So that's our recap. We're basically defining two things to sign in a certain way with Cozy and Seabor. And one of them is created by the issuer, and one of them is created by this transparency service. And this is a convenience function that will help a lot of CAs and RAs to survive authenticity, quality, and regulation control for decades to come. Yeah, and this is basically my last recap slide, I think. Uh, yeah. Oops. Yeah. Am I Go doing that also? Oh, I'm also doing yeah, that. Okay. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> hi, I'm Hank. Um, <laughs> <laughs> 
we have done some work. So um, we have done something quite unusual. We had weekly uh, working group virtual interims. Some ADs frowned at that. I understand that weekly meetings are very rare. I think we are the first. No, we are not. A Seaborn uh, core interject. And so that could be called weekly, but you know, that's fortnightly. But let's not talk about that. Uh, we, we did a lot of virtual interims. Um, and the point is that we had to do these in order to get together um, non ietf I want to say, so newbies, new attendees um, that are not really familiar with the process, also not really familiar with the thing that we are building. Because, of course, when somebody we're talking about S bombs and salsa and all this cool stuff, uh, you think you can query something and now you know your S bomb is good. We are not doing exactly that, but we're doing that in hackathon stuff that's coming later. But what we're doing on the documents we have, it's a use case document and an architecture document, is basically improvement on how these sure sign statements are created and how they are then added to the append only log. That's PR94. That's basically text editions. Then uh, someone uh, recognized that we are a little bit weak on the normative language, so all the shoulds in there were like, and what's the reason when this is not? So a lot of shoulds have gone out. The, uh, the normative text is way more crisp right now. You are basically as an implementer. It could be implemented before. So we have, again, last Rackathon saw, seen that you can even offload this to engineers and they have no idea what this is and they can, can implement it. But, with, but their feedback was, it would be easier with better normative language. Um, we have yeah, a lot of cleanup to the uh, um, yeah, reference to claims. I'm not going to the detail of that. That's a lockdown thing. Uh, we have a clarification on the feed purpose because we add some cozy uh, header parameters that might or might not be needed here. Uh, I will jump ahead a little bit and say that we renamed, for example, feed to subject. That's not only a renaming, that's a reuse of the CWD claims and cozy header parameters. Uh, ID that's going to work in Google Glass Core right now. So we want to bundle some skit specific metadata in the issuing, so in the, the issuer uh, envelope. And it's not entirely clear where this goes. That's why there are multiple PRs on that. Um, again, you see WG claims and headers, yet another PR on this. Um, we also had a bucket before where we uh, stashed a lot of these uh, skit specific metadata that they don't actually want to uh, uh, register at the registry necessarily. Um, that's was called rec info. It's still in there. So do not be confused that we now have CWT claims as one item in the header and this rec info as another item in the header. They're kind of redundant or maybe not. And that is some discussions we have to really figure out. So they're both in right now. So you can see that uh, they are alternatives. Uh, I see Mike on the queue. I will look at the last PR here. And uh, yeah, the last one is basically uh, consistency of terminology because sometimes uh, we were not clear that we want to say consumer and producer, but I think that is clear. Mike is next, and the mic with a question or comment. Actually, uh, Mike Jones, the CWT claims and headers has finished ITF last call. It'll go to the ISG telechat Perfect. at the end of the month. That is that is excellent. So so we are, we are looking for yeah it was looking stable enough to rely on when we started this already. So we have faith in you of course and in the process of course. And so that is uh, that is my update. So what we can say in, in summary I think is uh, why we had weekly meetings that sometimes um, circle around a topic and then again because of weekly but it was really necessary to bring folks together that are not familiar with the IETF process, sometimes they were not familiar with the uh, uh, structure of a cozy envelope, and, and sometimes have to learn over time how this works. So we actually onboarded, I think, and that is, I call personally, I call that a success that can't really measure in PR numbers and in slide updates or running coders. We informed and knowledge transferred a lot of things to, to new members, to new attendees, and I think that is worth the effort. Nevertheless, uh, I think we are now planning to tone it a little bit down and go away from the weekly uh, uh, interval. So that's my recap on the PRs. Is there anything on another slide? I don't think so. Oh, yes. And yes. Oh, oh yes. This? That's important. I changed this twice. OK, <laughs> the, the first item is one item. <laughs> so this is, of course, a, a document we started with. So that is the use case document 
um, it's manifold. I think it also has a very cool feature. All the use cases are not um, disjoint. They somehow always overlap a little bit. They have some commonality. So they actually, when you compose them like a mosaic, they form a bigger picture. And again, sometimes you feel that there will be the, 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 the two signing things, the authenticity layer that we're building here uh, will provide queries and is, is, is immediately effective on websites and available and, and, and helping you and your, your, your supply chain needs with authentic statements about um, uh, supply chain products. But again, this is a two layered system. Uh, the use cases describe them all and define the requirements for the SCID authenticity layer. But in the hackathons, because that's out of charter for now, uh, we build the, uh, the proof of concept code around that. And um, somehow there's an item missing between call of adoption to speak. So, so that's not correct. Uh, yeah, and so there's a working, we have a working yeah, group last call on the use case document yeah. ongoing. So if you, I, I, ideally, I would like to see a, a show of hands if someone uh, in here could also volunteer to review the document who is not the author of the document. Yes. Okay, Ori, uh, HA, I don't see that. It's MCR. Uh, okay, MCR, so we have three people, that's excellent. We should write that down. Yeah, it should say that the working group call is ongoing and then just still have a chance to comment on it. So that's what's supposed to be on that slide, I guess. I think I'm done. I'm just waiting for the slides to come back. Yeah, you are. I just said <laughs> yeah. we we changed the slides this morning to reflect some of those correctness and okay. whatever I I uploaded it, but they're not on the um, pre-share for me Echo, so I'm just going to put them on my uh, on my screen instead. Okay, there we go. Thank you. So thanks, Hank. I uh, didn't see any more in the queue. So we're going to move on to registration policies. Um, so uh, two presenters here, because this was uh, a big topic at um, uh, 1.16. Uh, we discussed it a lot. Uh, we had a, a recap, and then we kind of put it down again. Um, so uh, sorry. And well, and during the calls as well, yes, of course. Um, so a bit of a recap there, and then uh, Cedric's going to go into some improvements and thoughts that we've um, uh, that we've had. I'll sort out the formatting uh, later, so it's better to have the right content. So um, as a reminder for for folks, uh, in the simplest possible terms, uh, as we defined in the, uh, the the document current draft, a registration policy is a simple set of rules evaluated by the transparency service to determine admissibility of a statement. Um, and it's worth remembering that uh, part of the mission here is, as Henk has already reminded us, to um, have lots of statements rendered transparent and give you this decades long trust in, in, in things that took milliseconds to create in a moment, uh, but have very long shadows. And so just accepting any old thing um, makes the, the, the life of a verifier or a trust system or a higher level application using these building blocks very difficult. So we need to have some kind of um, control over what we think is actually uh, admissible to the record. Um, and we had a lot of, of debate about that and it was all quite confusing. Again, Hank's kind of covered, <laughs> covered some of that because a lot of um, layers were discussed. Um, in terms of sort of application versus component versus message level versus protocol level stuff, you know, that all got mixed up. Um, and also even about sort of the requirements of what they were supposed to do, um, mixing up um, general purpose access control type principles with actually making a conscious judgment type things. This is, you know, it was 
kind of kind of complex, but we landed. Um, uh, I think the consensus of the group, as as, as I observed it, uh, is that we have a, a small number of requirements that define this minimal, simple set of rules um, concept, which is it needs to be payload agnostic uh, and interoperable. Um, where, uh, as for, for anyone in the room, I see quite a few new faces. So just um, as a bit of background um, to make sure everybody's clear, the CBOR, CDDL, COSI nature of what we're doing here is exquisite interoperability for transparent payloads so that you can move them around so that um, in pretty much any application that needs to record something knows exactly what message to send and can send it without having to you know, mess about with knowing whether it's an SBOM or whether it's a scan of a PDF of a self-attestation. You know, we, don't, we don't care about any of that. So the payloads themselves are, are, are opaque, but obviously any payload you want to send to any transparency service should work and should honor the rules. So that's what we mean by, um, by those two things together. Um, we absolutely can't predict all use cases or inputs. Um, so, you know, if it's going to make a conscious decision about whether the thing it's seeing in front of it is um, is is a, acceptable, um, this group can't define what acceptable means uh, in no small part because, well, that will be up to the application, and the application layer is out of scope for us. Um, so, so again, we need to have spaces in these structures which are able to transport, faithfully transport all of the sort of input signals and, and intention that we want to enable without um, unnecessarily constraining or trying to guess everything that will ever happen in the next sort of 30, 40 years. Um, so we need extensibility. Um, and then we need to address two sort of broad areas of, of functionality. There is general access control um, and the most important two of those, you know, API implementation is an issue. We need to make sure people can actually build these things. Um, but the important two in terms of the, uh, the working group documents um, is a concept of anti-spamming. We don't want to fill up the transparent record um, with just any old stuff. It just makes everybody's lives really difficult. Um, and it is mandatory, um, and, and, and this we ended up including partly because uh, of, of the discussions at 117 over identity and, and things like that, just to be very clear, uh, that in this system, you can't issue a statement to the transparent log. Uh, we don't use transparent log, but yeah, you can't issue a, a statement without being somehow identified as an issuer. And there's lots of leeway in exactly how you do that and how many keys you have and whatever else. But the point is you must be authenticated and identifiable in order to make a statement. Um, and so we need to kind of separate out those exquisite interesting details about what it means for message level signing versus wire level authentication, which are kind of implementation and, and whatever slightly different details. And then what that means in terms of um, the entity recorded as being responsible for the statement versus the entity that actually sort of moved the bits and bytes around and contacted a server and pushed it up there. Again, slightly different things. You need to accommodate both. Um, and then there are what um, Cedric's gonna, going to talk about, um, which is the statement-specific registration concerns. Um, so somebody in, again, for those who are not totally familiar, um, the fundamental thing in Skit is that um, it enables entities called issuers to make statements, which is a bunch of claims about things, which is, we don't care what it is, but it's a thing. Um, one important thing though, is that if you make a claim about the same thing, it's the same thing. So you can say, you know, I, I built my software, my software was reviewed, my test passed, I got my release approval, I released it. And the it in those statements, it should always be the same. So that you've got a coherent, links kind of graph of knowledge about that piece of software that you're potentially bringing into your risk profile in your business, that kind of thing. So clearly, in some cases, it's really useful to allow people to talk about your thing in terms of, you know, I looked at it and it looks cool, or I bought it, or I, you know, I tested it. But in many other cases, it's very unuseful to allow just anybody to talk about your thing without it being very, very clear that it is them having an opinion about it and not your opinion about it. So we've got the, these kinds of subtleties 
really need to be built into the structures because although they are and may seem very kind of application specific and going into semantics of supply chain operations and whatever, if we don't have places in the structures that very clearly communicate these concepts, the applications won't be able to build, use the building blocks. So that's a kind of really core thing for, for what we're doing. And then underneath it, you know, um, we want to make sure that things are uh, not unreasonable in terms of the balance of knowledge or where you have to move things around or introduce bootstrapping problems, that kind of stuff. Um, and the bottom one, which will be very important to what um, Cedric's going to talk about and a, a big breakthrough that, um, that's that been made uh, in the last sort of couple of weeks, um, is that the registration policy determines whether or not a statement is admissible. Uh, and that can include things like if you've got a decentralized or distributed system and you've got lots and lots of bits of software or machines making statements about stuff that's going on, they might not necessarily issue these things in the right order. They might not even know that they're racing with some other better informed entity that's going to make more useful claims, things like that. So just as one narrow example, you know, if things arrive out of order, you might require or request the transparency service to not record it because this thing is, it, it is it's lost its usefulness before it was ever recorded. I want to reject that thing. So with those kinds of rules in place, if Henk comes back in 20 years to verify a receipt and say, well, you know, this thing clearly when it was signed, it was okay because signing is always okay in the moment. But now, knowing all that I know, is it still okay? You need to be able to go back and not only verify the crypto and say, yeah, the crypto is okay, but also say, and how was this thing produced? Was it actually properly vetted? Was the issuer properly validated? Do I now know that they had their key compromised at that point, but I didn't know at the time? All those kinds of issues. You can only truly verify that if you know both that the statement is intact, i.e. authentic, i.e. has its integrity, and also what policy was in force at the time it was accepted so that you know that that policy was properly evaluated. Uh, and it's that last thing um, that, that um, did seem exquisitely complicated uh, when, 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 when the group first started working on it, but has now become um, very, very simple. So um, I, won't, I won't go into any more of that because Cedric is going to do that on the next slide. But um, small short version is we've identified a way of, of eating the elephant one bite at a time. Um, it yeah, it seems, seems to be working. And so um, obviously working group is always at liberty to work on whatever it wants to. Um, but uh, I would expect that if, if people are observing, um, expect to observe work on the registration policy stuff because there's been some really nice movement in the last, uh, last couple of weeks. Uh, so, Cedric, if you'd like to explain to people progress, that would be fantastic. Uh, okay, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm Cedric. So, uh, so, yes, we have been discussing that for uh, quite a while, but uh, I'm happy to... Uh, uh, explain what uh, we are converging on and notably uh, at the hackathon yesterday. So the, so the uh, as explained by uh, John, the main challenge is uh, that uh, in many cases to understand uh, what, uh, uh, what the, the register statement means and what the receipt means, you need to know uh, the context or the configuration that was used at that time. So, uh, so when you verify a receipt, you know that you have a uh, and the issuer signature, you know that you have a statement made by the issuer and registered at the point of time. Uh, now, uh, part of the configuration are critical for that. So as an example, if you are using a certificate-based certificate identification uh, for the issuer, then you need to know which root certificates were uh, considered acceptable at that time. Uh, and uh, similarly, if uh, you uh, are uh, enforcing some uh, normalization on the uh, subject of the statement, you need to know what were the rules being enforced at that time. Um, so, next slide, please. So, uh, the first part of the solution is uh, more general. It's also something we have been working on for a while, but where we are uh, nicely converging. We need a way uh, 
that is uh, uh, to uniquely refer to a transparent statement as it has uh, at registration time. So the important event here is the fact that a, a signed statement is made transparent by registering it in the, trans in the append only log. And we want to be able to refer to that uh, unambiguously. And so that's what we are calling uh, registra uh, registration IDs or statement IDs. Um, and uh, once we have that, then, uh, next slide, uh, we can uh, bootstrap the process by uh, storing uh, the configuration or the registration policy that is being enforced using uh, a statement of a particular type uh, onto uh, the transparency service. And so, so we have, uh, uh, the, uh, let's say, the first statement on, at the transparency service that defines its initial configuration, and then that configuration can be updated by issuing and registering a new configuration statement that describes the changes and make them uh, transparent and editable. And now uh, we can use the statement ID for that, the, the, the latest or the current registration policy uh, to refer to uh, the rules being applied at the time of registration. Um, next slide. And so now when uh, we uh, register some uh, 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 further uh, statements from uh, less uh, 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 any other issuers, we can uh, embed into uh, the receipt the, uh, this uh, unique identifier to the policy that was enforced at that time. Um, next slide. Uh, so, so now some verifiers will be satisfied by the receipt, some others may verify also the signature from the issuer, and some of them, in, in case of that, can always go and fetch. Uh, from the transparency service, the policy that, that was applied and uh, so that they can uh, confirm what was the rules that were applied at the time of registration. And so, uh, of course, uh, you can, uh, next slide, you can cache that. So uh, you expect the configuration not to change too often. And so in most cases, you can, you are, we have it locally, you can also uh, staple it. What, what is uh, very important there is that uh, as before, the verifier uh, need not contact the transparency service. It can uh, verify uh, the receipt for the uh, statement that it is uh, considering and also the receipt for the policy statement that it refers to. And uh, all of that is just uh, uh, calling the crypto library. Uh, next slide. So uh, in short, uh, it's good to see we can uh, uh, incorporate the uh, uh, configurations or, the, or the, 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 moving, uh, the moving bits of the registration policy as a, a skid statement, so it makes them discoverable and transparent, so it also uh, uh, increases the trust and the auditability of the transparency service itself. Uh, it's also a good way of uh, removing some of the bug, bug of the complexity of the architecture in particular. Uh, the complexity is not gone, but now we know it can be... Uh, uh, contained into how we are going to define the details of the configuration or the details of the registration policy. It's not uh, in formal text uh, in, the, in the architecture anymore. Uh, so there are still some uh, technical uh, questions. So we have, uh, we have been discussing uh, fiercely in particular how much uh, uh, integrity we can get out of the process. So uh, as a baseline, it might be okay to trust the transparency service to attribute and to return the correct ideas, <laughs> but uh, we think we can do better in particular. We, uh, we would prefer to have the ID being uh, authenticated and uh, uh, extracted in a reliable manner out of the transparent statement so that uh, to remove further opportunities to be confused about uh, what uh, uh, transparent statement is referring to. Uh, next, please. So uh, there are uh, many other uh, open questions. Uh, uh, but uh, they seem less uh, problematic, or at least uh, I think we, we know enough about them to converge on that point for, uh, for the first version. Uh, so terminology, so we have been uh, moving back and forth between calling uh, those special statements registration policies or configuration. In a sense, we don't want to have uh, separate configurations if, if that includes things that talk about uh, uh, policies for... Uh, like uh, software patches or whatever that is not directly related to registration. But uh, uh, 
Uh, so I think we are leaning towards configuration, but uh, but both uh, that's the, that's the situation. That's the status. Um, so uh, we are, have also been thinking that it's uh, although we aim to provide generic support for uh, supply chain uh, transparency. Uh, in most cases, you want to actually document the application profile and explain what the supply chain is, what are the custom rules for that. And so we have been referring to that informally as an application profile. And uh, we think that the configuration may be a good place to uh, include that application profile, maybe just as a, a TSTR to begin with, but uh, at least a place so that it can be recorded and uh, that it is discoverable. Um, so, um, we don't want to go too far there because there are uh, supply chains comes in many uh, shapes and colors. But uh, what we, I think, intend to do is try a couple exemplary, uh, very simple use cases to show how we can have uh, 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 some syntax for them, so for interoperability, uh, and then uh, stop there and let uh, people decide what uh, what, uh, what are the most useful uh, patterns and which needs to be uh, standardized for uh, uh, revisions of the, of the architecture. Uh, so, quite deliberately, we are also leaving the rules for actually uh, uh, registering and updating the registration policy itself uh, opaque. So, that's implementation specific, of course. It should be documented, but it seems hard to agree on that uh, in general uh, for every implementation. Um, and we think that already being able to uh, get the uh, a sequence of, of uh, configuration updates as a series of uh, uh, sign transfer on statement is, uh, is, a, is a good step forward. Uh, so similarly, we think the registration policy is uh, always going to be uh, mostly opaque to the skip layer. So uh, a big part of it is going to be specific to the application or to the implementation uh, or both, but uh, uh, maybe working out a couple of examples like how to include uh, a list of root certificates or a list of supported uh, uh, content types or uh, supported uh, mechanism for identifying issuers uh, would be good enough for this kind of thing. The next slide. Uh, that's it. Okay, that's uh, well done. Thanks. Thanks, Cedric. No questions in the room? Okay. It's an early morning crowd. Uh, okay, so <laughs> next up, um, Ori to talk about the Seaboard API. Awesome. Uh, hi. I'm Ori. Uh, so there's going to be two sections I'm going to cover. The first is going to be a high level uh, description of the Seabor API, the conceptual messages that communicate these concepts that you're now familiar with, the signed statement, the receipt, the transparent statement. And then after this section, we're going to look at a high level sort of uh, transport aware API for moving these conceptual messages uh, between parties. Next slide. And, and by the way, uh, I love questions in the middle of the presentation. So if you see something on the screen, you have a question, please go to the microphone. I'm happy to answer uh, as we go through. So at this point, you're very familiar with the core operation that Skit provides. I, as the issuer, give you the transparency service, a signed statement. I receive a receipt. Um, so the statement, we've said this word a lot, it could be a file. Uh, it could be an artifact, it could be a set of claims about an artifact. It's, we use the word statement as a placeholder for this generic structure uh, that's relevant to a supply chain. We want to provide integrity around that structure, so we need to produce a signed statement. In order to do that, we take the statement as itself, as an opaque payload. We add additional issuer claims. We use the issuer signing key or uh, signing capability in the case the key is uh, backed by hardware or you know, uh, some more complicated security process to protect the uh, material associated with the issuer. And then that issuance process produces the signed statement. And after we have the signed statement, we can perform registration. So we'll take the signed statement. The transparency service will apply its registration policy. Uh, if the registration policy is, uh, the decision is to admit the signed statement, that signed statement will need to go into a transparency log or an append only log. Um, and as 
part of once that operation is complete the transparency service can include its its notary claims its perspective on what uh, has just happened and use its signing key or a signing capability to protect the receipt um, and the receipt is produced at that point then now we have a signed statement from the issuer and a signed receipt from the transparency service. When we compose these two, we receive this transparent statement. Um, and that's the sort of core uh, pseudo CBOR API. You're gonna see messages in a second that are gonna correspond to these, these components. The coloring on this uh, slide is meant to sort of convey how trust improves over time as we allow multiple parties to commit themselves to uh, the byte representation of information about a supply chain. So we start with the statement, we're not really trusting this thing, it's opaque. We don't really know what it's about, no one's looked at it yet. As part of reviewing that statement, the issuer is going to commit themselves to it. So the signed statement already includes a higher degree in trust of trust because the issuer is signing over this object there evaluating and they're making a decision and they're signing. And so trust is improved slightly by signing this original statement. When the receipt is produced, the notary has also authenticated the issuer. So there's further uh, improvement in the trust. And then when the signed statement and the receipt are composed, transparent statement is achieved. That's why the transparent statement is green and these other uh, artifacts are uh, on the color spectrum towards red. So it's meant to um, convey that there's an improvement in the review process, hopefully uh, more chances to catch potential problems in the supply chain. Um, and that's why the coloring is the way that it is. Next slide. Okay, so I hope you all have taken uh, CBOR uh, <laughs> uh, Extended Diagnostic Notation 101 because that's what we're gonna be looking at for the next several slides. In case you have not, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, one note is that uh, in designing uh, these message structures for SCIT, uh, I had to learn extended diagnostic notation. I had to learn CDDL. I really wish someone had come up to me at the beginning of this and said, just learn extended diagnostic notation and CDDL before you start talking to anyone. It will make your life a lot easier. It's been very, very helpful to me to just look at these examples instead of trying to match up the, the CBOR language and the English text in our document. So I found the, working with the examples personally really, really helpful. Um, and so if you're interested in SCIT, I would encourage you to also look at the CBOR structures first. Look at COSY sign one, understand the basic structure of a COSY sign one. Look at a protected header, understand the basic structure of a protected header. What that basic understanding, it'll become easier to understand what SCID is, is trying to achieve and how it's using COSY and Seaboard to achieve it. Okay, so this slide here is about the sign statements protected header. Um, so you can see the first, you see this one and then minus 35, that's the algorithm indicator for the digital signature. Minus 35 is ES384, which is an ECDSA signature with a SHA-384 hash. And there's algorithmic agility at that layer. Uh, in the future, if post-quantum signatures come along and we want to use a post-quantum signature, minus 35 will become some other number. Uh, and that's important property of uh, cryptographic um, building blocks. Sometimes you really want algorithmic agility and we get this by building on top of COSY. The next line, uh, three, it indicates the, app, the content type of uh, the payload. So um, in this case, it's application JSON, but if it was an XML file, it would be application XML. If it was a CBOR file, it could be application CBOR. It could be a vendor specific media type, um, um, perhaps a application SPDX plus JSON or another SBOM format that's in XML. Um, so content type is a useful property to communicate. Um, and since we're, we're gonna be signing this statement, it can be helpful to know the content type of the statement that we're signing. And that's uh, recorded in the protected header. The next uh, tag uh, or label is four. That's the key identifier. That's very helpful uh, in discovering the public key that we'll use to verify the statement. 
Um, I'm going to skip to the bottom now, to the 33, because you probably wouldn't see 4 and 33 in the protected header at the same time. Um, but I put both of them here just so that it'd be easier to talk about. So 4 is a key discovery hint to help you find a public key. But what if you weren't using that particular approach? Perhaps you have a certificate chain that's important. Uh, tag 33 or label 33 here will help you include that certificate chain so you can verify the uh, signed statement uh, with that particular trust model. So again, you probably won't see key identifier and, 30, um, and certificate chains in the same header. There are two different ways of accomplishing this, this uh, mission to help discover keys for an issuer that you trust. Going back up to the top, um, you've heard already that we've been starting to use CWT claims. Uh, I've included a TBD zero because this, this requested assignment keeps changing. At some point in the future, CWT claims will have a fixed uh, integer value for expressing them in a protected header. And at that point, uh, labels one and two will be useful identifiers for identifying the issuer and the subject, which are both text strings according to the CWT registry. And that's um, a lot of flexibility, a text string, so we may see refinement there in the future. Uh, and then um, you've heard about registration info. Right now, that's uh, 393 for us. And as an example within it, a secure version number that's a skit-specific claim. Again, you may see TBD0 and uh, 393 collapse in the future or perhaps remain separate. Uh, look forward to the discussions on the mailing list regarding that topic. Next slide. So this is the body of the uh, transparent statement. Um, and I say transparent statement here because you can see that it includes a receipt in the unprotected header. So tag 18, label 18, um, it's cozy sign one. Uh, as you become familiar with CDDL, you'll get very used to seeing cozy sign ones. They show up all over the place. Um, the first component of the array is the protected header, and that's a Seabor encoded uh, byte string in this representation. We just looked um, at its value, the protected header value on the previous slide. So that entire object that we were just looking at now is just this first element of the array uh, represented by the protected header here. Uh, the next component is the unprotected header as a map, and it contains this minus 333 label, which is a placeholder for the concept of a collection of receipts. Um, one of the interesting things to think about for transparent statements is that the same signed statement may be made transparent by multiple services. Perhaps you have several different software uh, auditors that are required to review a signed statement. So you'd want to see an independent receipt from each of them because they each maintain a separate transparency log. Um, so the important, well, this is actually an improvement since the previous IETF. We've added the ability to include multiple receipts in a signed statement. And uh, you can see it's expressed by the minus 333 label and then an array of uh, encoded receipts, which are opaque at this layer, but we'll take a look at that structure in, in a, another slide. The nil, that represents a detached payload. That's important because sometimes you're signing something that's really, really large. Perhaps it's a machine learning a model that's like several terabytes you know, in, in size. Probably don't want to duplicate all of that data. So detached signatures are very valuable, useful uh, construction for large payloads. Also, a large software configuration um, or other large data structures, detached payload can be a really useful way of uh, putting a small signature next to a really large thing that you're trying to protect. And then finally, the signature component. Next slide. So uh, we're now looking at one of those receipts that was in the unprotected header on the previous slide. And it's another cozy sign one. So you can see tag 18. That's what tells you it's cozy sign one. The receipt has a protected header, but this is the protected header that the transparency service is committing to. So uh, different than the protected header that the issuer is committing to, and we'll take a look at the protected header value in the next slide for the receipt. But for now, we're also looking at the unprotected header of the receipt, which has minus 222 
which is indicating that this receipt has proofs, in quotes. What kind of proofs are these? Well, depending on how the append-only log is constructed, there may be a need to identify different proof capabilities that the log offers. So uh, a simple example in a binary Merkle tree, you'll see a consistency proof and an inclusion proof. The inclusion proof proves membership in the log. The consistency proof provides proof that the append only property is being maintained by that service provider. Those are both valuable proof types and we need a way to express them in the unprotected header of the receipt. We do that by using this minus 222, which says this is a map of proof types. Minus one is an inclusion proof. And inside of uh, this inclusion proof, there's, there's only one inclusion proof provided here. But there are scenarios where perhaps you would see multiple inclusion proofs. There's a scenario where you might see an inclusion proof and a consistency proof. This data structure is meant to make it easy and flexible for us to enable that functionality. But we may see profiling within SKIT receipts that sort of turn some of this optionality off as we become confident that it is maybe optionality that is harmful complexity or unnecessary for the purpose of securing a supply chain. Or perhaps we become convinced that consistency proofs and inclusion proofs should both be mandatory to support and in some context for SKIT. So again, uh, something to be discussed over time. Again, a detached payload and a signature. Next, next slide. We're now looking at the protected header of the receipt. You're seeing the first uh, digital signature algorithm identifier one and minus 35. This means the signing algorithm is ES384 with SHA384 hash. And um, uh, four is the key identifier. I've omitted certificate chain details in this example, but you can imagine perhaps they are present and key identifier is absent. And TBD zero, this is an important detail. This is the identifier for the data structure that the transparency log is using. So uh, RFC 9162 defines uh, the data structures for certificate transparencies uh, style transparency log which um, is a binary Merkle tree with the minimal uh, consistency and inclusion proof data structures you can achieve in a binary Merkle tree. And so if you want to express that your transparency system is implementing the same data structures that RFC 9162 is, you'll use some TBD tag and then one, and that will convey that you're using the proof types that we saw before are the binary Merkle tree inclusion proof and binary Merkle tree consistency proof as described in RFC 9162. The TBD one here is the CWT claims. Again, um, that will get an assignment hopefully soon. And then we'll have a clear understanding that one is the issuer claim and two is the subject claim. And here you can see the issuer is the transparency service because this is a receipt. And the subject is this registration event ID or some described identifier chosen by the transparency service that they're assigning this receipt to. I think that's it. Any questions? No one in the queue. So um, thank you very much, Ori. Very cool. Uh, ready for the next one? Yep. OK. So now that you've learned the basics of the envelope structures, um, <laughs> Why are we laughing? What, did I miss something? No. It's just, oh, a, no. it's just early. Hey, yeah. everyone, stand up, wake up. <laughs> right, there you go. <laughs> yeah. I know. A Seabor can put me to sleep too, guys. It's OK. Um, all right. So now that we've seen these basic uh, envelope formats, the basic conceptual messages, these are really useless if we don't have a way of moving them around. So I'm going to describe a kind of hypothetical REST API here. I know this is the IETF, and sometimes we get concerned when we see the words API up on the screen. So just to be clear, the, what you're going to see in the next several slides is uh, one way to do this, but there could be other ways in the future. And the important part are these interoperability points provided by the um, conceptual messages. Uh, but I, I think that thinking about SCID in terms of APIs like this is really helpful. It, it helped me understand what's the interaction model going to be like? What would the 
experience be to do an integration as a developer? So hopefully you'll find this valuable. Um, and in the case you think there's something really horribly designed and that you're gonna see in the next several slides, please come and tell me. Uh, so, Reverend, sorry, I yeah. didn't put myself in the queue. I, I just wanted to say a non-technical thing to make it really clear. I think it's great we're talking about it as an API. I think there is this misconception that the ITF does not do APIs. That is incorrect. We absolutely kind of do do them. So carry on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yep. There we go. Next slide. Okay, so we've already discussed this statement. It could be very large. Here I tried to use some color on the right-hand side, and some labels to sort of show you the parts of the API, maybe their relative size, and the color kind of indicates your trustworthiness in them. This large statement thing, maybe it's a machine learning model that I believe was not tainted with adversarial training data, or maybe it was, I don't know. That's why it's red. It's untrustworthy, right? It's large, a statement. Uh, underneath it, it's gonna become a signed statement. And once it's got these receipts, I will trust that signed statement as a transparent statement more. I'm showing multiple receipts here to remind you all that you can have multiple receipts on a signed statement. Um, so the first example is a signed statement with three receipts. And the second example is a signed statement with one receipt. Um, in both of these cases, you can see all three of the uh, core uh, messages or structures within Skit. The signed statement, the statement, the receipt. On the left-hand side, you can see a hypothetical curl API for moving these things around. And I'm not very good at curl, so uh, please feel free to correct anything you see on the screen here. Um, of course, these URLs won't work, uh, but they're Parts that are omitted are kind of the irrelevant parts. Um, the important part here is that this first registration um, operation, we're gonna want to push this statement and its signature to the transparency service. So we're using the post operation, and we're including the statement, which is a very large XML file in this case, and the sign statement, which is hopefully a very tiny detached signature uh, as a CBOR cozy sign one structure. And I'd like to point out that moving the statement like this when it's several terabytes is probably not a great thing. I don't know how many of you have curled a really, really large object uh, often, but this is a potential problem part of moving signed statements around like this. The, the signature is tiny, that's great. But if I have to move with the signature this very, very large object that the signature is applying to so that you can verify it, that's sort of a problem. So stay tuned for solutions to that on the mailing list in the coming weeks and months. The next part is re retrieving the receipt. So after this uh, curl operation that probably took a few minutes to resolve, hopefully if the connection didn't die, has finished, I should be able to get my receipt. So it could be that uh, this sign statement is gonna be made transparent um, within that operation and that the response from the post would include the receipt identifier. Or it could be that that's gonna go into a batch and then it's gonna sit in a queue and like several minutes later, it's gonna settle into the log. So at some point, I'm gonna get a receipt identifier. Uh, maybe I have a long running process identifier that I get right away and then I go check back to see is my receipt ready? Nope. Is my seat receipt ready? Nope. Is my receipt ready? Oh, yeah, it's finally ready. Great. So whether it happens instantly or it happens in a few minutes, everyone loves eventual consistency, you're gonna get a receipt eventually. With that receipt, you're gonna want to be able to store that receipt structure. So the important part of this curl uh, example is to say, we're gonna try and save this receipt as a receipt.cbor. So now you've got your sign, you had your statement and your sign statement, which you sent. Eventually you got receipt. So now in your local curl environment, wherever you're calling curl from, you have three files. 
I've pr pr pretended that there is a command line tool called skit up transparency, <laughs> supposed to make you feel like you're up armoring, maybe, I don't know. It's just a made up command name. The point is, you've got your statement, you've got your sign statement, you've got your receipt, and now you can produce your transparent statement by putting this first receipt into the sign statement. And these are the colors here correspond to the logical concepts on the right hand side. Um, the skit, skit up transparency command that's totally made up again. It's, mo it's meant to convey that composing receipts into the sign statement is a thing that can happen on the client if you've retrieved a receipt. Technically, you could have gotten the transparent uh, statement right back from the server, but then the server would have done this operation for you. So again, how does how when when are these uh, messages combined? Who combines them? There's option that there's there's different ways that that can occur. Um, in this case, I like to think of the client as sort of preparing the statement, preparing the signed statement asking for a receipt from the transparency service and then including that receipt in the signed statement and then maybe doing that again for a different transparency service. Maybe I'm going to one transparency service for one kind of uh, receipt and going to another transparency service for another kind of receipt. So I'm gonna be the one who puts those two receipts in my signed statement because I know that I'm gonna need two. Um, if I'm gonna get a uh, transparent statement from only one transparency service, maybe they would do that combination for me and just give it back in the format that I want it. I think that's it, next slide. So we promised you that feed was going away, but I'm here to bring a version of it back. Um, <laughs> so in the previous uh, slide, you saw how the sort of unique identifier for the receipt was produced. Um, and here I've shown you at the top two fragments of URLs. The first is an identifier for a collection of receipts on a transparency service. You could imagine this as an identifier for all receipts produced by this transparency service for all time. Probably not a very useful URL, uh, but conceptually this is the list view of all receipts on a transparency service. Underneath it is the detail view of a specific receipt. Um, and this one you might have gotten as the direct response uh, from your registration request, or you could have gotten it as a response from a long running process that eventually settled. The important part here is these top two URLs are kind of the generic concept of all receipts for all time from this transparency service for this specific receipt from this specific registration event. And while those are nice and useful, they don't actually help a application developer or service provider understand receipts that are relevant to their supply chain. What, what, what that entity really wants is give me all of the receipts related to my suppliers. I'm interested in the integrity information and confidence information around the identity of my suppliers when did they rotate keys? Why did they rotate keys? What's additional information about them that's important? So when we start to ask those kinds of questions, we start to think about subscribing to a feed about a topic. The transparency service could express that as a URL. So the bottom part is one potential way that URLs could express this concept of feeds related to topics. And the bottom URLs and the top URLs are at the discretion of the transparency service. So that service could decide to expose this information many different ways, and this is just one example. But I like to think about transparency services giving you views of suppliers for a product, views of ingredients that go into a product, lab test results for a product over time, origin certificates for a product over time, or origin certificates for the ingredients that went into the product over time. Those are concepts that apply to pretty much every supply chain, whether it's software, whether it's seafood, or perhaps it's semiconductors. Next slide. So at the last IETF, I 
I take full responsibility for most of the confusion that was generated regarding feed. I think I showed a slide about GS1 and their architecture. And if you don't know, GS1 is the company behind barcodes. And my, while I was feeling really good about telling you all about barcodes, I think that did not land super well. So this time, we're going to talk about making soup with ingredients. It's a little bit simpler, and hopefully the concept of feed will be smooth sailing from here on. But if it's not, it's still my fault, and I'll keep trying. Um, so I, I like to think about supply chains as sort of having a directionality. Uh, the most simple way of thinking about a supply chain is thinking about a linear supply chain. We have an upstream direction and a downstream direction. As you go upstream, you encounter raw ingredients, uh, the, the first component of something. So perhaps this is where the minerals are extracted from the mine for the very first time uh, you know, in the jungle, or the lumber is harvested for the very first time in the forest, or perhaps the tomatoes are picked for the very first time in the farm. And then that artifact, these first raw ingredients start to move down the stream. And as they do, they become processed. They become uh, tampered with, potentially. Problems could occur. Problems can occur at the farm. That's the earliest point at which a tomato can have a problem, basically. But that ingredient could have problems all the way down to the point at which you take a bite out of it or you drink a bowl of soup that has tomatoes that have a problem in it. So you have to think about where, the, where could the problems start? And how do I track where problems might occur? And how can I use uh, sign statements and transparent statements to secure my supply chain? So for the tomato uh, farm, perhaps they do have a product. And you're welcome to go uh, see if any of my GTIN numbers are right or not. I still put GS1 identifiers in the slide. Um, but but you, the point here is that for the tomatoes, maybe I want to know where were they grown? Are they organic? What kind of labor activity was going on there, et cetera? Please. Oh, dude, I'm going to keep going. Please, rather have the question now. Hi, Roman Roman Daniel, uh, AD. So I'm channeling kind of Hank at the importance of kind of repeating the things from the beginning of onboarding so everyone kind of understands. This is, of course, already a notional example because the scope of this working group is software supply chain. Correct. And it's just illustrative that there are other kind of supply chains and we have the eye on the prize to finish software Thank supply you. chain. <laughs> yes. Right? <laughs> just making yes. sure. Yes. Thank you. You're, you're correct. But, um, and, I, and you're going to see this tomato soup will become software by the end. <laughs> 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 okay, so uh, I'm going to kind of move along quickly so I don't get uh, in trouble anymore. Um, noodles, uh, at one point noodles were wheat, but still for noodles I may ask what kind of wheat, what, how was the wheat processed, where were the noodles made, the carrots, where were they grown, how long since harvest, are people allergic to carrots, what kind of allergy information do I have around this ingredient? This is the upstream supply chain for the soup vendor. Next slide. Then there's this entity that picks only the finest ingredients to make soup. You just saw how some representations around those ingredients. And then this particular supplier, they produce soup. And that soup is bought by uh, distributors. But, but those distributors want to know, what did you put into your soup? Who contributed to those ingredients? Are they trustworthy? Uh, where do your tomatoes come from? All of those questions. Um, so in, imagine being asked to prove where your ingredients came from as the soup manufacturer. You would want to have some structure with some integrity and some transparency and it would make your life a lot easier to just say, here you go. My receipt for my tomatoes, my receipt for my noodles, my receipt for my carrots, and here's a receipt for the soup that I make that includes this sort of structure around my upstream supply chain and is useful to my downstream consumers. Next slide. Right, so about software. So software and firmware, they're like soup. <laughs> <laughs> right, 
thank you. Uh, so here, I've asked for uh, artificial intelligence to generate me a hypothetical uh, firmware network device thing, so they don't have to mention any vendors. Uh, this is Magic AI firmware hardware, a wireless device, and it's got it has firmware in it. It's it's got chips in it. It's got configuration. It's got other details, and and I'm about to plug this thing into my home network. What is it? Why should I? Why should I allow this thing to talk to the other devices on my network? Why should I plug this into the wall? I'm terrified about every part of this totally fictitious, made-up hardware device that an AI generated in like three seconds. Like, what questions should I be asking before I expose my family or my customers or you know anyone else I care about to whatever this thing is? So the first question I might ask is, has this device been certified in any way by anyone ever? Maybe there's a QR code on it that I could scan to get some feed information about this device. So certifications, other details, all of those questions you had about soup you might have around this device. Are there vulnerabilities that have been reported since the device was made. So the vendor may have believed everything was good when they packaged this device up and shipped it off to a distributor where it sat on a shelf for five years before someone picked it up. But in five years, new information could become available about the quality of this product. And when before I plug it in, I might want to know, is there are there other problems that have been discovered since the manufacturer produced this? Um, has the regulatory landscape changed? Maybe uh, at, at the time it was made, it was certified to be safe and details were fine, but like the law changed between then and now. So maybe that's in, of interest. Has the product been recalled? I would definitely want to know that before I plugged it into the wall. Um, is there uh, an upgrade path, I should say path, for the installed firmware? Uh, is the device still supported? Are there any unpatched CVEs? These are all questions that I have. And uh, at the top, you can see this L dev ID. This is just one way that people think about giving devices identifiers. And you might use that kind of identifier in a feed. We're asking for critical information about that device. Uh, and again, we're here to talk about software, but software goes on devices. So hopefully this is acceptable. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, please come to the mic. Uh, Dan Drutz, at and uh, Thank you so much for uh, the illustrative <laughs> uh, example. Uh, I like I like soup too. But uh, <laughs> I wanted to ask something. Um, it seems to me that there's a catch-22 with with these questions and answers because I'd like to understand. You know, you're asking these questions at the time of installing the app, but the receipts are already issued. So how do I know, how can I create maybe a profile or a template of things that should be asked? So at the time of, of, of the issuance or the time of in, in, the, in the upstream, there are proper receipts that will answer those questions. Thank you. That's an excellent question. So... We have in the signed statement this place where we talk about registration information, and the issuer could be aware of requirements that they are committing to at the time at which they're making their signed statement, they're securing it, and they're asking for a receipt. So perhaps I know that um, this device is actually going to need to be certified for operation in a few countries. I could sort of say, I know that that's going to happen, and the registration policy that this transparency service should be applying should be aware of that as well. I'm looking for a device certification. I'm looking for an analysis of my opaque payload, perhaps. Those, that Looking at that payload is sort of outside of the skit layer, but probably very much in the realm of things businesses will do with the skit. They will look at the payload. They may look at the integrity information around the issuer. They may say, uh, I have extra information that I use before I decide to issue a receipt. And I will review all of that. And then I'll make my decision. And I'll give you a receipt only if I feel satisfied. And if I don't, I'm not going to give you a receipt. 
just to add to that, if you weren't here at 117, there's a good example. So the, the hackathon target for 117 was a model of a federal software supply chain use case where they know that they need, before you accept something, I need the vendor response file saying, yeah, we followed all the checks and we're good. And I know I need the SBOM. So although Skit doesn't know this itself, there was a model in the higher level application that simply said, automatically check, do these two application types exist? Got the receipts, off I go. And if I don't, then they, then they don't. So, yes. Hi, Thomas Werner. So on the previous slide, you mentioned um, LDAF ID. So I have a question to that. So shouldn't it be IDAF ID in that case? If it comes from the manufacturer here? No, help. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it should be. OK, yes. Should be on the question. It's the tank. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you. Hey, are you re responding to that point? Yeah. Okay, we'll let you queue cut and then AJ, you can come in after. You can have already walked over. So I made him write LDF ID. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reason why I'm here. <laughs> yes, so um, depending on the scenario and which transparency service you ask, it's the LDF ID or the IDEF, <laughs> IDEF ID, of course. Um, you can have the local identifier generated and still ask the questions about the device, but it will be a different trust domain that you're apparently now uh, referring to. And this LDF ID scenario here is when you have something provisioned in a factory floor and there is a uh, transparency service in charge of its own uh, you know, policy things. But it can be a global thing and then you can use an IDEF ID that, that, that actually doesn't matter. Just one example of how you would uh, uh, identify the uh, um, of the product in question. Um, I think the LFID scenario is a little bit more interesting because then uh, you can uh, really make up uh, your own um, um, transparency service about the provision state and your uh, dependencies all over the world. That's up to you. You can do that. And that is the cool thing because there's not just one transparency service. There are many of those. And, and, and just going to the local scope here that is, that is controlled by you. I mean, and this is an interesting example, but it doesn't have to be, of course. And to be clear on that, so it, it can be different vendors in the chain. And it can be different vendors in the chain and it may be not the first manufacturer, so not the first identifier of that device. Exactly. And so now um, you could uh, still have access to the IDF ID, compose it, and then have all this information together, like, like your own, own authority, the information, and the manufacturer's original opinion. And that might be vastly different. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So, uh, AJ? Can I just stand here? And no. no. No, you need to talk to the mic. Okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Right. Hi, um, AJ, you know me. Um, I just want to roll back because I'm getting kind of lost. Are we talking about setting the context of what's happened? And we're going to talk about where this is in the relevant, I guess, architecture and scrappy uh, draft? Because I'm trying to understand, is this like where we were or where we're going with... Sure. The general concept, the REST API, or both? I'm trying to recover from my disastrous description of feed in the previous IETF. Uh, so we just looked at the REST API, and you saw receipts. And then I, I said, what one receipt or all receipts not very helpful. What if I could get receipts related to a topic that was helpful? Now we're looking at a specific topic that would be helpful, the LDEV or IDEV IDs. Receipts regarding that particular topic that's what we're discussing here. Okay. Uh, and, and to answer your question regarding ITF documents, uh, everything that I'm saying should be consistent with our architecture. If it's not, uh, then we're going to you know, rectify but that. But it's a good question, nevertheless, um, which is like we extracted the document from the architecture about the API description, moved yeah. it into a separate document, which was not published in time for the deadline. So I hear you asking, like, what's the story on that? Yeah, I'm not, not. I'm not heckling with that. I'm just asking: no, Is that we're going to fix it, that? Does that does that draft up that's emerging? Does that need to be updated to reflect uh, topic subject terminology? 
um, and the thing you're talking about, and this URL example is the thing that we're moving towards? Yeah, so okay, the I'm document done. does need to be updated, but part of the document has already been updated to reflect what you're seeing here today. All right, done, thank you. Um, next slide. So we had these questions about this topic, and in the response we get from the transparency service, we may see several useful files that you may be familiar with in a software supply chain context. Uh, the SPDX, SBOM, a Cyclone DX, SBOM, Salsa, VEX, vendor response files, another VEX update, because things change over time, uh, revocation alerts, new versions available, or end of life material. These are all examples of uh, specific statements that may have, may, may have been made transparent that would be relevant to this topic of the LDEV or IDEV ID or whatever other topic identifier you want to use. So the generic building block here is that feeds allow downstream suppliers to subscribe to relevant information about their supplies, supply chain that is provided by an upstream supplier. The feed is a generic structure for communicating that ability. And when you uh, query a feed, you may get results for receipts for files like this or other files, depending on your supply chain scenario. Next slide. That's probably it. That's it. Yeah. Any other questions? Seems like people woke up <laughs> right towards the end, so play. Right. it's good. Yeah, right around the soup. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks, Ari. Okay, great. So um, it feels rude for me to sit down for everything, so I'm going to stand up. <laughs> uh, so, yep, hackathon report as ever. Um, those who were at the hackathon um, might have noticed that for the first time in a while we didn't do a readout in the uh, in the readout section. So this is an exclusive for everybody who got here this morning. Thank you very much. Uh, slide, please. Uh, oh, and again, this is my header. So um, good participation as ever, full tables, um, people stealing chairs from each other uh, as, as, as they got up. So, you know, good health indicator for us there. Um, and just to say much more spec focused than, uh, than code focused this time. So press the button. Um, and as you've just seen, um, there was a big... Um, Step forward, I think, that uh, Cedric's already talked us through on um, registration policies. So this wasn't the only thing that was discussed on the spec. There were a few other little um, sort of details and edge cases, uh, but this was the, the, the vast bulk um, of things. Uh, and I wanted to go into just a little bit more detail because obviously what has been decided and, and will be written down in PRs and stuff, of course, will become fact and legend, um, but what wasn't... Ooh. Um, but what sort of didn't make it in, of course, um, wouldn't necessarily. So um, just for those who, who weren't there and don't know what was discussed, lots of complexity in, in registration policies came from things like identifying whether this is a sort of client-server type relationship where the, the issuer and the transparency service have some sort of hierarchical relationship or whether it's a peer relationship and who gets to choose if they conflict in their opinions about things. Um, so all of that kind of stuff um, seems to have been uh, worked out uh, and, and, and will continue to work it out. But uh, the separation that uh, Cedric explained got rid of that. Um, part of the conversation about um, the, the name change also was, re was recognizing that maybe configuration, including things like what root certs I um, uh, I, I believe in. It's not really quite in keeping with the principle of registration or a policy as such, but it is something that is needed to be known. If I'm asking, again, of many of the sort of slightly more abstract or um, hand-wringing things that we discuss are in the context of Henk's um, excellent summary that really why we're here and why, we, why do we need something new um, is to provide very, very long-term trustworthy decisions. Um, and so those kinds of things need to be need to be verified. And um, uh, and lastly, you know, the ideas of policy languages and things like that. You know, um, we did have a very 
good go at thinking about whether we needed to define any of that. Um, and happily, I think there was a very strong conclusion that no, we don't. Um, it's not necessary to define any of that or get into discussions about formats and types. Um, just the same as we don't pick winners with what kind of S bomb you want to put and, and attest to in these in these transparent statements. Uh, we just need to make sure that we can accommodate any choice um, so that as, as the world moves or as people more focused on that particular problem area make progress, we're not getting in the way or stopping you from doing that kind of thing. So um, although the, the conclusion might be very simple, you know, give it a label and then put the label in the receipt, uh, the process was thorough. It was an excellent discussion. I think we came to a very good, uh, good conclusion. So thank you to everybody in the photo from the last slide for, for participating and and indeed many who weren't. Um, slide, please. So um, yeah, at the last two hackathons, we've been able to show um, some decent running code. So I'm glad that in this one, we flipped the balance back a bit and, and have shown some rough consensus, which um, restores, restores balance to the universe. Um, there was actually a bunch of work done, and there was some progress made, um, but owing in all sorts of things, um, we didn't quite get anything finished. There is breaking news, uh, and this is part of the reason for having the wrong version of the slides uploaded, um, is that strictly outside of the hackathon, but this morning, um, we did have a decent, um, a decent breakthrough, uh, which I might, if you don't mind, I'll have you just step up to the mic and say something about it in a second. Um, but just to, to keep a, a people appraised of progress, um, I'll skip the first bullet because it's got its own slide now. Um, but API access control um, has been moved along a little bit, just kind of, again, proving the point that we can accommodate um, proper things like OAuth um, and OpenID Connect, along with all of the kind of message level uh, and structure level stuff that we're doing that Ori's talked about. So that's great. Um, improved out did resolution verification. So the implementations that, um, uh, take my chair hat off for a second, um, my team in my company has made an implementation and we've added um, the did web um, key resolution step to the um, uh, issuer and the transparency service uh, identity verification steps. It's all working for us. So that's, that's cool. That shows that works. Um, we've got rid of the, the need for a translation proxy. So that was the other um, deficiency that was noted at 117 was, um, you know, we thought it all kind of worked because it was possible to get things from one end to the other and back again. Um, but obviously it's impractical to require translating proxies and, and, and message format changes in the middle of a real world sort of um, entity to entity trust system. So we've managed to eliminate that, which is good. Um, and most importantly, and this is where the, the links at the top um, uh, come into focus, Roman, um, made the point that we want to concentrate on finishing, I think was all completing, I think was the word, completing software supply chain. Um, so having made progress on the two big things um, that we noted at the last meeting, which was um, feed slash subject slash thing identity and the registration policies, actually it feels tantalizingly close. Uh, and so we want to switch a bit of um, uh, focus for those who are of a, of a mind to sort of implement things and, and play with this stuff, switch over to really adding some meat to the examples um, in this second uh, spot here so that we can actually prove it works. And, and essentially the thinking is, well, if we have an example for each use case, and if the use case document, which um, Hannes issued the um, working group last call uh, a little while ago, so that, that should be completing really soon. So if that gets um, accepted, and we've got an example for every use case in that document, then well, we can kind of claim we finished and we can we can make a call and we can hopefully publish a V1 uh, that meets the, the thing. So um, yeah, loads of loads of progress, loads of nice proof points. Um, yesterday, we didn't have anything to show uh, on the code side, but uh, slide please. This morning, um, there was a, a PR, for those of you who watched the, uh, the GitHub repo, there was a PR whose commit message started with, it works, exclamation mark. So um, uh, if you don't mind, uh, John, I'll hand over to you to, uh, to explain this slide. Okay, thanks. All right, so uh, the PR is about federation, um, and the 
PR that exists right now is just using ActivityPub. Um, ActivityPub, for those of you who are not familiar, is a W3C spec, um, which basically it has this concept of actors, um, and so which abstract beyond just a direct service-to-service -service interaction, which is something that you might find just like link data notifications, right? So this is one one abstraction layer beyond that. And what we're doing with this PR is really just trying to get events of new statements that have been submitted to the transparency service. Um, and so services which federate with each other might, uh, you know, they would receive an event from the, ser the, the other services they're federating with, and they would decide, they may have different registration policies, right? And they may decide to issue a receipt um, for a given statement or they may not, right, um, depending on, you know, what their policy is. So uh, if we could just jump to the next slide here, let's see. Um, let's see, I updated this link. So, but we can click on it, and then we can click on me, and then I have a, I have a, a cleaner demo uh, link here. So, oh, okay. So let's see. I, I made it because this is way too small. So. Is that working? Oh, that's working. Let's there you go. So what we see here is basically we see Bob on the left and Alice on the right. Um, and what we're going to do is we start both services. Um, Activity Public, as I said, has this notion of actors and followers, right? So Alice follows Bob, Bob follows Alice. We create a claim, we submit the claim to Bob, and then, or let's see, we submit the claim to Alice, and then uh, we wait for a moment as we see these uh, create note events happen and follow events here within the services, and then we end up downloading the, um, we downloaded the claim and the receipt from Bob. Um, and so that kind of happened within the background on the top service, service right? So, cool. cool. Yes. Okay, good. So snatching, uh, snatching victory from the jaws of defeat. Let's go back. There we go. Thanks. Thanks for the work. Yeah, no, thank you. It's been it's been great. Uh, and that just for uh, benefit, um, I pointed out the examples um, repo just to reinforce the API emulator repo is where that work <coughs> happened, uh, and where we have the um, we've got a couple of independent implementations of the uh, of the draft API. Uh, so if you're interested in that, if you want to run it, if you want to um, participate, it's all happening there, um, and and obviously. Conversely, even if you don't want to participate, but you want to know what's going on, it's all open and you, know, you can you can see it. Uh, great. So um, next bit, I wanted to have uh, a few items to uh, to talk about. Um, so uh, Hank's already alluded um, to to this, and a few other folks have as well. Um, we have had a lot of meetings uh, between 117 and 118. Um, and yes, they were um, useful to get everybody on the same page. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the suggestion is that weekly meetings for the next period up to 119 is maybe a few too many. Uh, I think we've got that um, conceptual consensus now and it's more important to uh, uh, actually sort of work in the mailing list on um, uh, topics, I suppose, and work in PRs and issues on actual um, changes. So um, while there's absolutely no um, prohibition on people sort of chatting about stuff much more often, and, and we, of course, welcome that official meetings, um, interims to kind of take uh, consensus votes on uh, big topics um, proposed to move down to uh, just once a month. Um, and then, yeah, have much more work on the PRs and issues uh, where people can actually make make progress and, uh, and, and stuff. So everything's still as open as, as ever it is. Um, it's just we're pretty close, we feel. Um, and I certainly have, have been fielding as a sort of chair feedback a, a balance between being transparent and inclusive, but also not drowning very busy people in too much information. So. Um, so that's the, the proposal there. Obviously, give me feedback. We can change it, but um, that's the that's the intention. Um, and more importantly, and I see Roman 
teed up at the back. Um, for those who, who didn't pick it up last time, who was at the mic, Roman's our area director for, for security. So Everyone. very um, honored guest here to talk about uh, the, the sad loss of um, <laughs> our, friend, our friend and co-chair, uh, Hannes. Yep, uh, despite rumors, I'm not dead. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> And I hope also the slide when it starts with more effective and then new co-chair, that is also unrelated. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, the truth is that uh, a year ago when Roman asked me to help out with the, with, with this initially with the BOF and then subsequently with the formation of the working group, I agreed to do it uh, under the condition that I would do it for a year and try to make as much progress as I can. But... Uh, but yeah, now the year is over, time flies. Uh, the group has made a lot of progress, I think. I'm quite happy about this. Um, one of the documents in working group last call and, and you've seen the, in the presentations today, like there's code, there's uh, specification work that has been done, tons of meetings and so on. But um, yeah, but it's, uh, I think it's also useful to sometimes say, I'm, 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 I will just move from this chair to this chair over here. So not, <laughs> I will not be gone. So. I, I came up and like to say kind of exactly that. So a profound thank you to you, kind of Hannes, uh, for everyone's kind of benefit as Hannes's point. He said, you know, I can only give you kind of a year. I'll help you kind of get started. Boy, we have really launched a level of enthusiasm and kind of excitement uh, around kind of the regular cadence of meetings, how we're making documents and everyone coming to the IETF to work on this problem is kind of really phenomenal and exactly kind of what we need to do. Uh, Hannes, I'm glad you were able to give us a year. I mean, we wouldn't have launched uh, where we are kind of without your help. So really kind of thank you for kind of all your engagement and your leadership to get us from the very beginning all the way to, to, to where we are. Now the working group, of course, uh, is kind of wondering, we're, we're not gonna leave John kind of up there solo. So in the coming <laughs> weeks, Paul and I are gonna be working to make sure that the team is fully rounded out. So by the time we launch again in, in 119, we see each other in person, we'll have all this squared away and we'll have it squared away much sooner than that. Uh, kind of, of course, so Hannes again, kind of thank you for all your help here. Okay, great. So we're coming coming to uh, to the AOB section, um, which is where I guess you get to choose whether to um, stay here or, or, or go grab a break. Um, so we do have some some drafts, uh, supply chain use cases. Uh, as we say, you know, please please do take a look at that. Um, I was about to say we don't want it to sail through sort of with, with, with minimal or no review, but actually I think it just can't. Um, so yeah, we really do need to, to take a look at that. And if there are improvements to be made, we should make them uh, we have a quality mindset in this, uh, in this working group. Um, we have the architecture draft, um, a lot of changes lately, um, a lot of stuff actually being cut, which I think is a good sign. Again, it's a sign of completion because all the exceptions are being removed and we're consolidating on a few consistent coherent structures, which is great. So that's going to need a, a bunch more work um, to, to encode all of these breakthroughs, but um, coming on well. Um, there's the receipts uh, stuff. So for anybody in here who's tempted because of our sort of constant talk about append only logs and Merkle trees and stuff, that's the place for you to go. Uh, and please do help. There's all sorts of um, interesting implications of, of formalizing things in there, of, of adding optionality, as Ori's already said. Um, you know, there are some subtleties in the math or the structures that, that we're encoding these things in that can have quite profound effects in terms of what technologies and math you can and can't use um, for, for this technology. So if, if you're that kind of person, uh, please do look there and help and have opinions. Um, and then there's Scrappy, which we've mentioned a few times, um, for those who didn't know, we made the decision um, just last time at 117 to split the architecture document in two. Um, so the content, or at least the initial content of, of Scrappy, was a precise cut and paste from the bottom of the architecture document from a kind of informative appendix into a working group document of its own. So the, the, the content was no different to what was reviewed and, and um, worked on prior to that. It just didn't really belong in there. So we uh, split it out and now it's got its own 
uh, got its own life. So those are the the four places where we officially um, work together. And then, of course, you know, the the work of the emulator and the examples in GitHub. Um, clearly not working group product as such uh, and not normative, um, but useful ways of proving this out. So the, the idea of those is to say, well, if we've got this idea and we change the spec in this way, what will that look like? Uh, and, and really make sure we've got something robust. So those are the, the places to work together. Um, and the related stuff, um, so obviously Cozy, um, Henk already mentioned Seabor. Um, I see three in the queue, so I couldn't see that before, so we'll get to those. Um, so there are many other um, bits of IETF that we're using, of course, but these are the um, uh, really implicated uh, other related um, related graphs. Uh, Hank? I can't, I can't read the slides anymore. <laughs> I'm, I'm just improvising now. So um, if you go a slide back, you're saying that uh, there's the go-to, the third item is going, it's going to go away. Okay. Um, because um, what we tried here to is to do a hierarchy of building blocks. Skits should just be a frosting on, every, uh, on building blocks that are m applicable to all, many domains. So we have a cozy co-meter ID uh, again, is it's concise Merkle trees proofs, and um, now we understand that it might be more than just trees, but we are sticking with Cometer for now. That will be the actual place where we do the uh, inclusion proofs for the receipt, uh, and then Skit will only frost a few items around that. And so, so there will be other users. Uh, so if anybody's uh, somehow kind of enthusiastic about uh, Merkle trees or other MPAD only log structures, uh, look at the Cozy Working Group. Um, we are um, creating that work there actually, and then uh, uh, use it in in Skit. And uh, that's, that's, it's it's basically just a section now that has moved back into the architecture. Doesn't mean it has to be there, but many number of documents, ISG, you know there's something good with having this in one document. Uh, same goes with, for example, uh, timestamps. I've heard that when you want ordering in, in uh, signed statements, you would sometimes want to include a timestamp. There's also a header parameter in Cozy that is using the old TSA, TST um, to be included in a Cozy uh, header. Um, again, all this work is then more universal and will be utilized by Skit. Uh, so we may, might have to draw a little map at some <laughs> point, what we're using, where, and what. Thanks, Hank. Um, Simon? Hi. <laughs> Thanks, Hank. <laughs> yeah, Simon Friedberger, Mozilla. Uh, I just wanted to say regarding the use case document that I had a look and What's missing in my view, and it might just be somewhere else, so in that case I apologize, is a mapping of the metadata to the actual use cases. Because it says in the beginning, we are not defining the individual messages because that would be too much. But then in each use case, it says something like, we want for this product to find all the audit reports. Right? And that's kind of a contradiction because either the message is opaque or it's not. And I feel like there needs to be a mapping of the extra data that isn't opaque somewhere. Is that in the, does it exist or is it a work in progress? Uh, yeah, so thank you for the feedback. Um, it, it's for a bit of elucidation and, and as a sort of consumer of the spec, it, it's always good to get um, uh, those practical viewpoints. The group has to be very careful about not reinventing or making redundant copies of other people's work. So for example, we're not going to recreate or reformalize things like bits of uh, Cyclone DX or SPDX to then be formally indexable or, or, or whatever. And that's the fine line uh, to be walked. So we need to make sure these things are possible. And so to your use case, um, there's an application, um, there's a, my brain's gone blank, a, a content type. Um, and the issuer and subject. And so at a minimal um, thing, well, something we consider is that, well, if I 
know the issuer is my software vendor and I know the subject is the software package that I've subscribed to and we have a content type which is something you know VRF plus JSON is that enough you know we would hope it is but we always keep on thinking it probably yeah. isn't so that yeah that, that kind of feedback would be really helpful yeah so that's pretty much what I was aiming for right it would be great to add to the use cases the specific metadata that is solving that use case great thank you Hello, hi, uh, Max Bala from Cable Labs. Uh, I have a question that is related to the use case, probably, and I don't know if you're already addressing that. But you know, as you know, you know, we're trying to figure out how to migrate to a different type of cryptography in the next five to ten years, depending on your uh, time frame. And definitely, software supply chain is a big part of many of these frameworks that, that really look into that. So, my question is: Are you already considering uh, addressing that particular? Um, problem of tracking all the crypto um, capabilities, for example, for uh, that that you have in your software uh, upgrades, so that you can track the migration or help my tracking the migration through uh, something like Skip. Um, is uh, something that you're already considering explicitly? You already have it on the use case. You want to add it to the use case? Uh, I think is Ori. Are you in the queue to answer this question? Yeah. So Ori, then Cedric. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Ori Steel Transmit. Um, Yes, so uh, I'm involved in several other work items at IETF. I mean, one of them is applying the post-quantum uh, NIST candidate signature algorithms to COSI and HOSI. That applies to digital signatures. Um, there's also work to give post-quantum or quantum, uh, uh, quantum, what's the other word that we use? Quantum safe, yeah. yeah, yeah. The, for this, Everyone's looking for um, more conservative language in describing <laughs> these algorithms, but uh, in in as I mentioned in some of those other examples, Skid is designed with Cozy support to enable the le usage of uh, those cryptographic primitives as they become available. Um, but one of the things that you could do would be to make transparent your internal use of those capabilities either in hardware or in software products as well. That's very awesome use case, and perhaps one we should consider add or adding uh, and elaborating on in the use cases document. I'm happy to talk more about it yeah. offline. I was talking more about use cases, much like the microphone. Yeah, yeah I, I think Max's point wasn't, is Skit itself going to migrate to DQ, but are you tracking whether the things that it is describing, the software that it's describing, are PQ capable? <coughs> Because one of the things that we are looking into is how can we integrate with inventory systems, for example, they might have in uh, enterprises. Uh, some parts might not be you know, the best, right? But uh, with Skid, we, we might track, for example, the evolution of the characteristic of each device or each software upgrade, firmware, et cetera, so that you can track and you can apply tools like optimization. This part of the company will be integrated first. These other put some constraints. And since this is evolving, you, you get a picture of how you're evolving your company yeah. enterprise access network, whatever, whatever you're tracking. Mm -hmm. And this might be very, very useful use case. So I just I, wanted to point out. Yeah, I think, I think uh, that type of information would have to come out of, for example, S bombs and the configurations that go into the build process. Of course, it's a more complicated story, but like the whole S bomb topic is complicated. Uh, but uh, this would be like, for example, let's say you take a crypto library which algorithms out of that crypto library, which typically has hundreds, uh, are you actually using for your specific product? That would come out of the, the build configuration. Uh, so in like for embedded systems, with the C processor directives that would tell you what you actually compiled in. But uh, that's where I think it wouldn't bubble up at the layer of Skid what uh, Ori has presented here but it would be there. And I think you could do that. It would be another cool use case to demonstrate on how that works. Yeah, just to, to brief follow up on, the, on these responses. So yeah, I completely agree. That's a great use case, but that's something that uh, may not be uh, mentioned. Or you don't need any specific support in Skit to enable that. Uh, in terms of Skit implementation, we do have uh, built-in crypto agility for uh, signature and notification. One of the things that is more controversial and that we are not planning to support is uh, crypto agility for the 
uh, core algorithm for the happen only log because changing the hash algorithm <laughs> in, a, long, in a Merkle tree is tricky, but uh, uh, I'm happy to discuss it in more details in a few minutes. But I could imagine that we add some, some lines about the paragraphs to the use case document to illustrate this. Uh, yeah, and just before we recognize Steve, um, that's also some of the thinking behind having the configuration um, configuration rather than uh, registration policy, because exactly, you know, I use the example of root certs because it's more familiar, but also migration of trees and things could, uh, could, could come into that. Uh, Steve. Yeah, hi, Steve Lasker. Uh, I, the examples you're talking about, whether it be crypto agility of the particular artifacts you're putting on the feed or whether it's a particular SBOM, those are all great examples of why Skit is content agnostic. We know things will continue to evolve as different content types, but you want to register what is the information around a particular artifact. So the fact that new things are coming up is exactly the point. Great, Manu. Yeah, hi, Manu. Um, I'm a newbie, so I don't know if this is the right time for me to ask questions or comments, suggestions. Uh, just hold that thought. OK, I'll step back. Uh, no, there you go. I, just, I wanted to put your slide up. Hey, wonderful. <laughs> so I'm Manu Fontaine. I'm with Hushmesh, a cybersecurity startup. Uh, we work extensively with confidential computing. And um, maybe this is for COSI. I don't know. I'm, as I said, I'm a newbie. But I wanted to suggest a, uh, a, a symmetric uh, signature and symmetric uh, cryptography approach to SCID. Because once you actually embrace confidential computing, you can have uh, attested agents and verified agents. So that solves the integrity of the agent itself. Um, you can have then the agents use uh, symmetric keys to actually do um, HMAC signatures, which gives you an order of, of uh, an order of magnitude in performance, uh, gives you quantum resistance, uh, gives you a whole bunch of benefits, and it gives you, you know, the the, the symmetric signature ends up being an encryption key, gives you an, an encryption layer. Uh, it gives you a whole kinds of a whole range of benefits, uh, and then you know on our side we take it back the other way. You can actually have attested agents then that then can do the authentication of the user, the authentication of the organization. So now you can chain uh, those things in a way that is you know fully end to end between people, organizations, and things, digital things and physical things. And in particular, because Ori mentioned the silicon supply chain. I think there's uh, something that is also quite important to integrate is the fact that the silicon or chip level roots of trust um, have a level of inherent security that exceeds virtually everything else. Uh, and we believe that it's critical that the enrollment of a chip into uh, some sort of a you know, supply chain network or transparency service or whatever you want to call it um, be at, of the same, uh, the essentially the same level of security. So hardware-backed, you know, cryptographic security throughout the entire chain, um, and that has all kinds of very fascinating um, consequences and benefits. So I would strongly. I'm here my first time because I'm trying to reach out to different groups. I'm looking forward to meeting with you guys and and then see you know where we can take this. Thanks. Perfect. So while while Hank walks up to the microphone, I'll just say that's um, your first question was apt because some of what you said is relevant here. Some of it should go into to Cozy and, and, and things like that. But um, the to the soup example, um, absolutely, I would be happy with a lot of sort of mobile type use cases to accept software if it has run in an identified TE, but not if it was run just on an open RTOS. So the, the essence of your use case is absolutely valid here. So if you want to take a look at the use case document and see that it's represented, I think that's good. Uh, Hank? Yeah, hi, this is Hank. So to the uh, uh, um, topics that the Confidential Computing Consortium does, for example, and you mentioned uh, root of trust, so it's, there's a lot of on top of this stack of turtles that we do here in the ITF also, that is RATS, the Remote Station Procedures Working Group. I think uh, the um, attestation results or maybe very concise evidence uh, will, will play a big part here. Uh, we have dedicatedly excluded it for now. So we have a running system and don't rat on, uh, on many things at the same time. 
but for example, the transparency service itself uh, could provide uh, remote attestation uh, results uh, into its own append-only log to uh, vouch for its uh, trustworthiness. Uh, we have, for example, the issue that we uh, sometimes might in our plan to resolve uh, DIDs. Uh, resolvers are not inherently uh, trustworthy if they're remote, so there's, for example, a, a TLS that could uh, be a, a solution to that problem. Um, so remote attestation will come into a lot of places of in this year, and so there's will be another map, I assume. Um, but I would not high, I would not say that symmetric-based um, remote attestation is the only way to go here. There are multiple approaches. Uh, this is uh, now with the head as the TCG attestation working group co-chair on um, there are a lot of ways to do this, some of them including uh, symmetric crypto. Thanks, Hank. Uh, Daniel? Hi, Daniel Huygens. Uh, I wanted to very briefly mention that there was some discussion at the W3C uh, about potentially uh, introducing the concept of a transparency log for web application source code, uh, particularly for web applications that don't want to trust the server and use end-to-end -end encryption, for example. Um, and it was brought up that it might make sense to uh, build that on top of Skit, right? So um, I have a very preliminary proposal in the WICG um, around that topic. So if you're interested, uh, please also uh, come talk over there. <laughs> Thank you. Can, is the proposal written down somewhere? So I did write something. Again, it's very preliminary. Okay. It's just a, a brief. So there's a GitHub repo. Uh, the working title is Source Code Transparency. Did you send it to the list? Yes, sounds good. Thank you. Ned Smith, Intel. I actually have a question on uh, slide 33, which in Ori's presentation, where he was showing trust increasing from red to green based on addition of multiple uh, receipt issuers having issued a receipt. And <clears throat> thank you. And the question is, what did the receipt issuers do Using the using the the tomato or the soup analogy, what did they do to ensure that the tomato was fresh? From take the, take the case where the farmer asserts that the tomato is fresh, and then the receipt issuer comes along and says, "I'm asserting that you asserted that the tomato was fresh, but I didn't actually check that the tomato was fresh. Why should I trust you?" Yeah, so it's the classic notary example. Um, so. We have these two roles, the issuer and the transparency service. Sometimes we refer to the sort of signing entity in the transparency service as the notary. It's important to think about what kinds of activities is that entity engaging in before they uh, secure, they, they produce their receipt. So the minimal uh, activity that they might engage in would be authenticating the issuer, um, basically checking the signature on the signed statement. Uh, if, if if they're kind of a basic notary, that's all they're going to do. They're just going to say, is this an authenticated, is this, is this issuer, do they have key material that I can use to verify what they've put? I'm not even going to look at the payload at all. It's a completely opaque payload. I don't, I, I don't need see tomatoes. I just see issuer, public key, check, right? But a more advanced notary, uh, maybe one with some domain expertise, could start to look inside of that payload start to make assessment sort of decisions. Um, that's, that's detail that uh, it's at the discretion of the transparency service, how much rigor they wanna put into their registration policy that's gonna be applied to that signed statement. I don't know, Cedric or Antoine, you'd like to comment more, but we talk a lot about transparency services, so. If this, did, did that, it's first, Ned, uh, is it a sufficient answer or did I sidestep your question? It feels like, the path we went down with registration authorities for PKI, where a lot of people automated that step, and now PKIs, in some sense, are broken because there's no registration authority. So, so yeah, it's not perfect, but then we are not going to define uh, what to uh, 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 what is a good policy for tomatoes. So the, 
so the <laughs> so, so there, the, the main uh, the main benefit the immediate benefit is that you know uh, you have identified who the farmer is and you know who to blame or who to discuss it if you are unhappy with the tomatoes and that's already something uh, following on the analogy with uh, CS and certificates uh, this provides the counterpart for certificate transparency where similarly uh, you are not going to trust every farmer but at least you have a transparent record uh, to discuss it in case there is a uh, uh, disagreement about the quality of tomatoes. So, so a compromise might be that the type of check that the uh, receipt issuer did when they issued, when they signed the receipt, uh, is, is, would that be something that goes into the issuer claims? So that's a possibility. So uh, you have uh, claims and by issuers, and uh, of course, uh, if you don't trust or at all the issuers, then it's not very useful. So. You can have a refinement of issuers and different kinds of credentials, different kinds of accreditations, and all of that is enabled, but uh, we don't want to be specific about that as in the definitions for the, in the core architecture. Thank you. Okay, so um, we unfortunately had a flurry of people joining the queue with two minutes to go, uh, which uh, is, is not something we can accommodate. Uh, but Chun Chi, Liu, and Steve, you got in before the queue was locked, so if you'd like to make your points, we'll hear you, please. This is uh, Peter Chunchi, uh, Huawei. Uh, just uh, it's more like a comment that may relate to certificate transparency and uh, Merkle trees and uh, Jose. Uh, yeah. It's just uh, there's a new primitive popping out that's more efficient to you know build similar like Merkle trees. So when you are proving an inclusion proof of one element out of n elements, usually in Merkle proof you need log n of auxiliary subtrees and you need log n of building back and uh, this thing that the Ethereum blockchain is using is called a polynomial commitment. It's something that can, you know, when it's proving one or k elements out of n, it only needs one constant opening proof. Uh, it's almost always the same size, and the uh, verification of this inclusion proof is always uh, one constant. Uh, I think it's interesting. Uh, could improve the efficiency. That's all. Thank yeah, you. I think that's a great reason to maintain agility of the tree formats. Thank you. And Steve, close us out, please. Uh, hi, so Steve Lasker, um, related to the tomato one, I think it's a perfect example um, <laughs> because Skit's responsibility is not, as Cedric said, to verify tomatoes um, any more than it is to know specifically about SPDX or Cyclone or Steve's or Steve and Ori's new format. But what it does do is say, if you decide to trust Tomato Verifier Corp that provides statements that say they are organic or super green or whatever, then that's exactly what SCID is for. So it's exactly that kind of thing. So it enables that flexibility. And you're just, you create, create a registration policy that maybe says you trust tomato verifier issuers. And then that's what the registration policy is done. So that kind of gives that flexibility. I'm trying to see where Ned was, but okay. Great, thank you. So yeah, um, again, apologies, as I've said in the chat, uh, I don't like to lock people out of the queue, but we can't run over. So um, please do engage in the mailing list. It's skit at itf.org. Um, and we'll discuss your points there. Thanks very much for coming and uh, have a good ITF. <laughs>